Hello. Welcome to... Uh, I'm not actually sure. It says lecture 5.1, but who's to say at this point? Anyways, today we're going to talk about statistics. Uh, and more specifically, we're going to talk about Bayesian statistics. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, <laughs> confusion and complexity that is sort of assumed when you start talking about Bayesian statistics. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's actually quite simple. And the fundamental idea behind Bayesian statistics is that we count things, and based on how we count them, then we know the probability of those things happening. And uh, once you start to kind of dig in deeper, you realize, well, if you have various events and they're in some way uh, dependent on one another, uh, Bayes' rule comes into play, uh, with, which dictates how a conditional probability of something can be calculated from a, uh, a prior probability given other probability distributions uh, of, of the related events. It's a lot of words. We'll, di we'll dig into this. And, and this lecture is going to be pretty high level. We're not going to get into the math too much. So you can sigh a sigh of relief, I suppose. Uh, although I would recommend spending some time and maybe I can provide some resources for my other classes about Bayes, Bayesian statistics. Because ultimately, or fundamentally, what you're doing with Bayesian statistics, and we'll get into this in the end of the lecture, is you're updating what is called a posterior probability based on a prior uh, you know, distribution uh, based on observational data. Um, and essentially, this kind of makes sense. It's almost like, you know, say you have a friend and, you know, if, if uh, they flake on you, the first time they flake on you, you're like, oh, well, okay. But the next time they flake on you, you might have expect them to flake on you. And like, oh, you know, Jimmy, he's always five minutes or 10 minutes late or something like that. And then if they show up late, then that confirms your prior distribution, your prior probability, and now you come up with a new posterior. But but say, you know, somebody's late 10 times in a row, and then one time they're they're not late. They're there's um, you know, you know, early. And so then you're like, well, maybe I should update my posterior, my my new uh, distribution, my new probability estimate based on this sort of uh, observational data. So previously, I believe Jimmy was always late, but now maybe I'm like, oh, Jimmy isn't always late. Sometimes they're late, right? And that's what's called updating your posterior distribution based on a prior belief or a prior probability distribution uh, and, and weighted by some kind of, uh, um, you know, you know, distribution of, you know, how, how often do you, how, if, you've, if, if this happens 10 times versus 100, you can imagine that the amount that I'm going to adjust my posterior is going to be less than if it's 10 times, right? And so you're, you have these sort of uh, four components in the Bayesian formula, which we're not going to go into, I'm just kind of talking about it up front, is you have the posterior distribution, the prior uh, knowledge, the prior distribution, you have this sort of weighting factor, and then you have what's called a likelihood. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about all of these things, but the likelihood is also known as the observational data. So, okay, sorry for getting a little bit in the technical weeds there, but I do recommend uh, getting a little bit more familiar with Bayes' rule and, and Bayesian statistics because it's just fucking useful for everything that you'll ever do. So it's a good, good thing to kind of get acquainted with, and it's very non-intuitive, which is why so many people sort of freak out when you mention Bayesian. And if you ever want to sound smart to anybody doing machine learning AI, just talk about the Bayesian prior and people will be like, oh, and this guy knows what he's talking about. So just, just know that that's not true. Bayes Bayesian is literally, we're counting and that's it. It's just like counting and then dividing. If you can count, divide and multiply, then you are a Bayesian stat statistician. Uh, so let's d dive in. So let's talk a little bit about m statistical models and the, the classic example is always uh, flipping a coin, right? And the nice thing about a coin is that assuming it's a fair coin, you kind of imagine there's a fixed and generally equal probability of receiving a heads or tails given a fair flip of the coin. Um, so, you know, what we need to kind of, well, okay, let's assume that we don't know the, the, if it's a fair coin. We want to assess if it's a fair coin. So there's one parameter that we need to figure out, which is the probability of the coin landing on heads for any given independent toss, right? So what is the 
probability of if I was to give you the coin on a rainy afternoon, what is the, what is the likelihood that it will land on any given side of that? So that's the, that's the uh, parameter we're trying to figure out. So what's the probability of, of a single coin toss given our model of coin tosses? Uh, we're assuming a frequency of half uh, or, or you know, a probability of half, but we've assumed right that the outcome is a, a discrete binary outcome, meaning it's going to be one or the other which we already know is kind of, while a fair assumption, right, there's a non-zero probability of it landing perfectly on its side and, and not actually being on any given side. And so what do you do then? But again, we're making the assumption that that's not true. Uh, we're assuming that these probabilities don't change. So you can imagine if I flip it enough and if I don't pay attention to which side I'm flipping it from, maybe I'm removing material. And if you do this for a million years, eventually the coin becomes unfair and uh, is biased towards a particular thing. Bias is something that we'll talk about a lot. In, you know, bias obviously has a lot of um, you know sway in modern politics and whatever and PC culture and that. But bias actually comes from a very strict statistical definition, which is anytime the expected value uh, uh, of, well, sorry, anytime the sample mean, meaning uh, the way we measure uh, a quantity, uh, diverges from the expected value, the fundamental, what's called the, the, the population mean. This is some, comes from like the weak law of large numbers right, which is to say you have a uh, population and you can only sample from a sample swarm. So like you have a billion people or well, 7 billion people in the world, but you can only have access to 50,000. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine that that's a biased sample because you, the 50,000 people, unless you somehow manage to perfectly represent the distribution of the entire world, that group will be like, say you measure their height, right? Say 50,000 people in North America's average height is going to not be equal to the average height of the everybody in the in the world, right? That difference is what's called bias. That's the measurable difference between the say sample mean and the population mean. So, uh, right. I don't know. We got into a bit of a rabbit hole there. We'll bring up bias a lot more. But so yeah, next time bias comes up in conversation, you can say, well, actually it comes from the weak law of large numbers. And okay, sorry. So um, this is another thing that we're assuming, which is not always true for most events in real life. Uh, but for the case of a coin, we can assume this is relatively true that outcomes are independent from one another. And by this, we mean that the coin toss of one, co of, of one event and the coin toss result of another do not affect one another. So... Uh, the probability of flipping heads or tails is always equal to the same value uh, regardless of what's happened in the past. And I think this is actually a really important point to make about st statistics because often human beings are really bad at inf that, that, and, you know, doing random, right? We think random is some kind of equal, oh, it was heads last time, so it should be tails next time. This is sort of... A, for better or worse, an evolutionary aspect of human beings that we actually uh, attribute, you know, patterns and behaviors to noise. And actually, this is it's kind of fun, right? We talked about this in a previous lecture. You look at a, a noisy image and you're like, oh, there's clusters here and there. But it's just it's fucking noise. Like no, 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 no premeditation went into that. Right. And so often you'll see an actual string of random coin tosses, for example, and you'll see like four or five heads in a row. And the reason that's true, that that can happen is because every single coin toss is independent of the one before. So it doesn't matter. And you can very often find yourself in these sort of um, periods where, you know, you get the same outcome for a very long period of time that if a human being sees that, they're like, that's not random. That's yeah, anybody who's had a Spotify, you know, playlist shuffled or something has experienced the this experience of it not being you know, random enough. And, and actually it is random, it's just not random to you. And uh, so it's an interesting thing. So this is, comes from the fact that these things are independent and the fact that, you know, say 16 heads in a row has a non-zero probability. So anybody who's watching Foundation right now on Apple TV uh, might, might see that one scene where, uh, what's her name? 
uh, Salver Harden, I think, right? She flips the coin and is predicting the outcome exactly because somehow she has magic powers of being able to predict the, the, the probability and the mathematics and what have you of everything. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting... Uh, sorry, I guess it's, it's late and I am uh, talking about nonsense. So, okay, moving on. Um, so a distribution that, quite, that, that, that pretty well models this system or actually given the assumptions that we outlined has exact properties here. So it's called the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution um, essentially will tell us what's the probability um, you know, of a given set of outcomes given that the coin is tossed n times. And you can kind of pick apart this, um, this sort of... Uh, equation here the first component here the n factorial over n minus r blah 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 that's n choose r right so we're going to choose um for n coin tosses r occurrences of the particular outcome that we want and then the f is the probability so in this case that would be 0.5 and 1 minus the probability which is again 0.5 because it's an equal coin so actually when you do this for our case Right, you end up getting f uh, to the power of r times f, right? 1 minus f in this case is just going to be f uh, to the power of n minus r. And so what happens is the r cancels out and you just get f to the power of n, which makes sense. So now you're basically doing n, uh, n choose r times uh, you know, 0.5 to the number of outcomes, to the, to the number of times that we expect. Uh, and by the way, yeah, so this is the probability distribution or, um, you know, we're going to get this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, the binomial distribution is really, really useful for any situation where you've got a sort of binary set of things uh, and can also be used when you don't have it. It's what's called the, multino m m the, mul the, the multinomial distribution is the multivariate uh, version of the binomial distribution. So when you have multiple variables, uh, you can use that instead. And it's a little bit more complicated than this, but the same idea across multiple variables. So the let's talk a little bit about the difference between probability and uh, likelihood. So the probability of an event given a particular uh, model parameter or a conditional, a conditioned on some kind of thing, be it an event or otherwise, is P is this given by this kind of nomenclature here probability of x with a line of p. p can be anything. It could be a variable such as f, as we mentioned, right? So the probability of x, or if x is a random coin toss and p is the probability of, uh, you know, one or the other, that's, uh, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is p is some kind of event. So the probability of, you know, a coin toss, given that it's a Tuesday, uh, per perhaps there's some weird things were more likely to, you know, flip a coin on Tuesdays than on Wednesdays or something. Um, we can also talk about the likelihood of the model given the parameters. So this is sort of opposite, right? What's the likelihood that a given, okay, and this is, this gets a little bit weird because I think this, this gets a little bit in the weeds of what we're doing next, which is how do we um, come up with models that describe phenomena? And so the likelihood is the opposite. The likelihood is what's the likelihood that the coin toss that we saw, that the, the, the data that we're seeing is the product of a given model. So say I give you a string of coin tosses, right? What's the likelihood that the, uh, what's the likelihood of a particular probability, of a particular frequency as we were talking about, right? So say I gave you a bunch of a coin toss string of heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, right? So there's a 50% uh, chance of either one being a heads or tails, but it's clear that there's some kind of causality. Uh, you know, maybe it's not clear, but it, you can see that there's some kind of causality between that. And so all of a sudden the likelihood that this is a fair coin goes down. It's almost like the coin is aware Right. And the probability of um, the next coin toss is being dictated by the previous one. Right. Whereas if we see a uh, 
a, a random set, an actual random string of events. You'll see heads, tails, heads, tails randomly, like four heads, two tails, one head, three, very random. There's no real um, pattern in this string except for the fact that it's random and there's an equal, excuse me, a relative equal distribution, right? And by that, I mean, there's an equal number approximately of heads and tail occurrences in this long string. And so you can kind of see actually a couple of threads here. The more data you have, the better the likelihood can be. This is actually really important in machine learning, right? The better, more data, the, the more, the more better your model is. Um, but you can see as we maximize the likelihood, we are getting a model that can then predict, you know, more accurately the next outcome. Um, and by that, in like, for example, in the case of a random coin, if we were to actually, you know, minimize or, or sorry, maximize this likelihood, we would eventually get to a, you know, uniform binomial type of distribution where we're going to essentially uh, draw some value from a, uni a uniform value of zero to one. And if it's greater than 0.5, then it's a heads. And if it's less, it's a tails. And that's going to likely maximize this likelihood value. So this is uh, very uh, interesting. Um, so in a way, uh, maximizing the likelihood is a form of, of search. And uh, we may get to talk a little bit about that in this lecture. Um, we certainly will as we get into neural networks and machine learning type of things, but you can also do this in uh, heuristic ways, which we've seen before, right? Imagine a, say, um, a grid of various parameters, and then you can sort of triangulate the direction in which a certain set of parameters improve your likelihood. And by likelihood, we need to kind of come up with a way to measure an error and blah, blah, blah. And we'll talk about that. So kind of going back a little bit again, uh, probability is these are the parameters that we want to use to predict the outcome. So what's the likelihood of a coin being, you know, uh, heads or tails? And then a likelihood is kind of the opposite. What is the likelihood that a given model describes the data that we have? Um, so for example, let me just get these in there. Cool. So for a coin toss, say we know that a coin is tossed 100 times and we've obtained 56 heads. So we plug in the numbers and we see that this is the maximum likelihood estimation of that. And we can see that the probability that best describes this particular set of this, this particular data suggests a probability of an expected value of somewhere between 0.5 and 0.6. So pretty close <laughs> to the expected value. But as we mentioned bias before, you can see this is a biased coin. And the bias can be coming from two places, right? Perhaps the coin is fundamentally biased, meaning the coin is more likely to give you one outcome versus another. Or, and, and based on our data here, right, we've tossed a coin 100 times. Right? What if we do it a thousand or 10,000 or a million or a billion? As we get closer and closer to infinity, we anticipate, again, this is weak law of large numbers, right? As we get to the population, as we get n, small n gets closer and closer to big N, and by big N, we're talking population. In this case, that's infinity. We anticipate that this p value will get closer and closer and closer to the actual expected probability and for a fair coin that would be 0.5 so you can kind of see the bias here manifested directly in that difference between 0.5 and whatever it looks like 0.54 or six and so there's a small bias here and you can measure that exactly so again fun thing to bring up at parties when you've had a few beers um Cool. So complexity, uh, we've been talking a little bit about coin tosses. Coin tosses are pretty simple, can be described by one parameter, that parameter being essentially the, this, this sort of threshold, this probability thing. But as things get more complicated, more variables, uh, things get a little bit harder to estimate. And so what we kind of use is what's called the iterative maximum likelihood estimate, uh, which it, it's hard. Um, you can parameterize any kind of model this way and we're it's kind of out of the scope of this particular course and if you're interested uh, especially towards the later part of this course i'll be referring to a lot of my machine learning lectures and this is sort of what you're doing there right the simplest machine learning model that 
can really think of is a linear regression model that essentially takes certain parameters, multiplies them by features of the data, and then you try to kind of fit this curve, reduce this error, uh, which what you're actually doing there is you are maximizing the likelihood given the data set that you're given plus a set of parameters. Um, and so this is where uh, this, these sort of these off the shelf or otherwise optimization or minimization techniques really come into play. We're not gonna go too deep on this stuff, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool stuff. This is sort of when people say machine learning, they are talking about this. This is what machine learning is. It just may be like a hundred trillion parameters, <laughs> like uh, some of the new transformer stuff that's happening. Um, and getting that to work is a whole, you know, ball of wax in of itself. But, but um, so far we haven't quite found the place where these techniques tap out. Um, they, they're not perfect and they're definitely nowhere near the capability of the human mind. And there's a whole deep subject there. As you all know, I bring up neuroscience in my armchair fashion once in a while. Um, but, but we're qu quite far away from sort of tapping out the techniques that we've, or we've, we've been exploring. And there's some really cool stuff out there like GANs and, and, and so on, where all based on this maximization of likelihood uh, ob objective. And so this is also known as uh, unsupervised learning, where the only thing you're trying to do is optimize the likelihood. And when you're doing that, you don't, even, you don't even care. There's no like example. You're not trying to minimize some error. You're just trying to make your model fit your data as much as possible. When you can do that, say with a image of a human face, you can now create human faces that look like human faces but don't exist. And that's what a GAN is doing, like Style GAN 3 that recently came out that is just, you know, bonkers good. Um, cool. Let's get out of the weeds there. So optimization techniques. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Everything from just flipping a coin of, of choosing it, pun intended, to uh, heuristic approaches to gen uh, genetic algorithms and things like that. There's a lot of ways to approach uh, optimizing these these parameters. Um, you can kind of come up with whatever model that you want. It, there's really no limitations there. Obviously, some things are better than others for certain problems, but there's really no reason why you can't do one or the other. Uh, th this brings you into sort of a realm of computer science where things are measurably uh, like not perfect. It's, it's like you have an accuracy and that could be 70% and that could be good for your particular problem, but it's a little bit of a far cry from say A star or these heuristic or deterministic type of algorithms, which may not work or may fail or may take a really, really long time, but they like the, the, they're perfect, right? There's no like dynamic programming, for example, versus, um, you know, true reinforcement learning, right? Dynamic pro programming may not apply to all problems, but it has an answer. Uh, whereas reinforcement learning is usually using some kind of approximation, like function approximation approach that, that looks a lot like this. And we'll talk about that later in the course. So in the coin example, um, right, the, the parameters only depend on the kind of latter half of the formula, as we mentioned before. If the F is actually correct, uh, we, we, the optimal um, F value just becomes and kind of collapses down the entire equation into just F to the power of N. Um, but because we're trying to uh, fit this model to our data, we need to keep these things in there. And so uh, to make this simpler, uh, what we can do is we can just drop the, the rest of the, of the prop of the, of the thing of the, we can drop this n choose r thing at the front. Um, so what we're left with is f to the power of r times one to minus f to the power of n minus r. Um, and so now we kind of enter into the log likelihood uh, schema. And the, the only reason and this actually really um, confused me early on, like why log everything? Everything's log and exponential and what the hell. And the reason is, is very simple. A lot of times, especially in probabilities, we're dealing with very small numbers, right? Uh, the probability of a coin flip is maybe 0.5, but say, uh, what's the probability of 16 heads in a row? That's 0.5 to the power of 16. And if you do that calculus, you, you get a very, 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 very small number. Now, what's nice about logarithms is 0.5 to the power of 16. You take the log of this, this just becomes, so if you take log, 0.5 to the power of 16, you just get 16 times log of 0.5, uh, which is some you know relatively large negative number. 
times 16. So you get a relatively tangible number. So why is, do we care about this? Well, we're using computers, right? A lot of times we're calculating these things and in, uh, floating point numbers, as you all know, uh, have truncation issues, especially as you get, to, you know, the smaller, smaller values or very large ones. And so log likelihood is a very nice computational trick that we can use. And in fact, if you ever do find yourself having to use the binomial theorem here, or the, I'm sorry, the, the combinatorial formula here, uh, which happens sometimes, especially when you're calculating Gaussians and things like that, uh, you'll find that to calculate n factorial, right, for any value above like 14 is just an astronomically large number. It's impossible. And so what you can often use is what's called Sterling's approximation, and you can do a log breakout of Sterling's approximation by way of these log, these log rules. And you can actually calculate uh, indirectly an approximation of the binomial, uh, sorry, of the combinatoric thing or the binomial formula or whatever, because this, this whole thing, like say you're dealing with the scenario here where you have a hundred coin to tosses, uh, N is a hundred and N a uh, hundred factorial is like a stupid, large, impossible to compute number. So important to know about these limitations of compute and, and the fact that you can use logarithms to, to kind of bypass these problems. But in our case, we're not using the, common, the, the, the combinatoric thing. We're just using the FR, FR1 minus uh, you know, NR thing. So we can just break it out into these two things, which look, end up looking like this, right? Um, one thing that we, we kind of, we're talking a little bit about... Um, maximizing likelihood but in our case and this is just sort of a more because it's easier to minimize in many cases with certain frameworks because minimization of a number is sort of easier to understand but it doesn't really matter right because a lot of these optimization frameworks use what's called gradient descent or they take a function they find its gradient or its derivative and kind of go in that direction you're going up or down but people, because people say gradient descent, it's easier to go down. And so like, you know, it's, it's irrelevant, honestly. But uh, what we like, what's important here is you often see what's called the negative log likelihood or the NLL uh, and, and being the sort of thing. And you can see here uh, log of D given H minus log of P, uh, you know, of H is the equivalent of uh, a certain, you know, just like um, the, the, uh, the um, the probability of d given h divided by probability of h, but you take the log of that and you do the minus, and you get the whole thing kind of flipped around. So it's just a little bit more convenient. Um, so now we see a, con a kind of a curve like this, uh, and you can see that previous what looked like a Gaussian spiking around 0.56 is now this more smooth, wide curve that minimizes that has a local minima and a global minima at 0.56. And you can kind of see why this might be nice. If we're using some kind of gradient approach, I can be here on the curve and I can sort of draw a line in the, 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 um, the gradient of the curve and I'm going that way and I'm that one. And I can kind of go down and once I get past this point, I'm going up again. So I go back and eventually I sort of center around that, that best point. We're not gonna to talk too much about gradient descent and these optimization techniques, but all you really should know is that that's what's happening. These optimization techniques are essentially looking at a curve and trying to find uh, essentially local minimum. And actually this is something that's important to pay attention to because a particular curve may have complex things. So if we're talking about the binomial theorem, the binomial distribution, you have a really nice thing. And actually this is why this is so often used in this particular form the something to the power times one minus something to the a different power or the similar power is seen a lot in what's called the binary cross entropy loss, uh, which ends up look, looking a lot like this in sort of two different pieces uh, because of this nice sort of optimum. But often you have more complex uh, functions and uh, then you can find yourself in what's, uh, what's called a local minima. As you can see here uh, in the case of B, we start at B and we go down, we go down, we go down. We get to this local minimum, we start to go up, and, okay, we go back and we're here. But we can see that there's a better point over here. So if we had actually started at A, you go down, you can find a more optimal point. Uh, and this is um, kind of important because 
this curve, remember, is being dictated by the parameters that we chose. So, so in this case, uh, starting over here on the curve means that we chose a p-value of 0.1, and we calculate the thing, and we see that there's a thing, and we go down, right? And here it doesn't matter because we'll always find the same optimum. But, but in this case, right, say we have a value that we're trying to optimize, a parameter that we're trying to optimize, we're trying to maximize the, the, the likelihood of a certain parameter, and say we start at A, uh, we're gonna get a better result than at B. Now, it's a little, uh, the jury's out on this stuff. There, there's, this is actually where a lot of the science goes into and the research goes into in machine learning. Um, and, and I think the, the good news is that you're never, in, in real problems, you're never looking at these really simplistic curves, right? Often what you have is a high dimensional manifold, meaning it's not just a line like this, it's actually, they say, thousands of different variables and the, the loss function, this function that you're trying to minimize, is a really complicated looking function. And so you may get stuck in a local minimum in a particular value, uh, so like so you start in B and you get down here and you're stuck, but some other variable is, so you can kind of imagine like a saddle point, right? On one axis, you're, you're here, but then on a different one, you go a different direction. And so there's a lot of things that you can do, including adding stochasticity to your things, adding a bit of noise. We, again, this goes deeper into machine learning uh, than is necessary, but just know that in practice, you don't often get stuck in these local minimum uh, because just the dimensionality or the complexity of the problem uh, sort of keeps you from doing so. So um, this is important uh, and it's true. Just because you come up with a parameter that seems to fit your current data, it doesn't mean that there's some fundamental truth about that, right? We can kind of back into that with a coin flip, but uh, this is also what's called uh, in machine learning and, and statistics, in, in statistical inference, um, overfitting. So often you'll come up with a set of parameters that fit the data that you've seen perfectly. And it's often, you know, uh, demonstrated by these, like, imagine like three points of data that are in a line. It's like, so, you know, I lo we look at that, and we're like, okay, there's a line, right? But you could also draw a curve that undulates and hits every single one of those points at an inflection point. And so it sort of does this wacky thing. So now you give, uh, you look at a new d data point and you're like, oh, it's, it's some wacky thing, but really you want it aligned. So just know the parameters are not unique to the data. The, 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 these, uh, you can come up with any set of parameters that fit a particular data set. Uh, and, and so just beware of this. Um, I'm gonna skip this little thingy. Um, so, you know, what, what happens when things are independent, right? Say that I'm a person in a four player card game where the cards are equally distributed. Um, what, are the pro what is the probability for another player that has the queen of hearts if I don't have it, right? Um, I'm not gonna work through these examples. Like you can kind of play with this, right? A card game is a, a really nice example because generally speaking, there's a set number of cards, there's a set number of players. Uh, while each player has incomplete information about the system, the system has a set state and that state can always be dictated and so you can always sort of back into what is the probability of, of certain things happening given your information meaning the cards that you have versus the rest of the system so this is something i, I encourage you all to uh, work through so expectation maximization is this is an iterative technique for when we have some data um, but uh, we we wanted to you know, estimate the distribution of data. We've kind of talked about this already a fair bit. Um, a lot of the learning algorithms that I've been talking about uh, are really what we're talking about, expectation maximization. There's a lot of expectation maximization um, algorithms out there. The one that's most common is in neural networks with um, what's called um, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Um, and so what we're doing for neural networks, and we'll talk about this more, what's called maximum likelihood estimation. And what we do is we back propagate some kind of error signal. Um, and we also try to regularize the network to avoid overfitting. This may not make any sense to you and that's fine. Um, we'll get into machine learning a little bit later in the course. I also teach another class which has a, a lot of material on this subject. And I will sort of point you all in that direction. 
Um, or you can go and do like a Coursera on this stuff, which I really recommend. I think machine learning and, a and, and its inflection, like it's an in intersection with AI is just, uh, I mean, it's a subset of AI technically, right? But the, the techniques of ML, as we're discussing for AI for games, is going to be more and more and more and more important throughout your career. Like you're, I don't know, like let's say you all are average expected value of 20, 21 years old. Right. I think in the next 10 years, um, machine learning will become a sort of transformational uh, you know, uh, 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 effect on the world of game development. And something that I personally work on and a lot of companies working in this sort of frontier. So if you're interested, please reach out to me. Uh, I'd love to tell you more about it. Um, so let's talk about how we can actually use this to do stuff. Uh, we've already talked about uh, finite state machines and the sort of next next step from that point is a Bayesian net. So unlike a finite state machine, um, which, which sort of have these sort of conditional things, a Bayesian network is a probabilistic graph model. So it looks just like a finite state machine, except the dependencies are, are, are sort of um, statistical in nature and can be updated based on data. So like Know, like you have a prior your prior is your current network and then you have a posterior which is you know your new network that better describes the data based on the observed um data that you see so uh here we go the right the prob the prob probability is what you believe before and then the posterior is the probability of the event given uh the observational data that you've seen so this is going to get into bays here and again i really recommend actually deep digging into the mathematical aspect of this, but we'll do our best here. So say that we have a disease called muggles, which is a little bit on the nose, but you know, okay. And the probability of having a disease is P muggles. So the probability of a person being uh, boring or P boring is just P boring. And the probability of somebody having muggles if they're boring is the probability of muggles given that they're boring. So here you have a sort of a probability of a particular thing given a uh, fact that they're boring. So you know they're boring, <laughs> what's the likelihood that they're a muggle? Um, and this can be calculated as the union of muggles and boring. So how many muggles are there? What's the probability given all people, right? And, and this is a very easy equation, right? So the number of people um, and you, you over, so you take the number of muggles that are boring Divide that by the total number of people. And that's the probability that you have a muggle that's like that, that somebody's muggles and boring. You divide that by the probability of boring. And what's the probability of boring? That's the number of boring people divided by the total population, right? Um, so you can kind of see these patterns um, kind of sneaking out here. And that's your probability of the muggles given boring. And if you actually dig into this a little bit, um, th this is a, uh, th this particular equation here is Bayes, um, is the Bayes formula. So the, the joint probability, when you say joint, it means two things are true, right? So and, or a union, uh, is equal to the probability of one thing given the other thing times the probability of that thing. So what's, what's uh, P of joint A and B is equal to P of A given B times P of B. And the opposite is also true. So pro the joint probability of P, and, P of A and B is equal to P of B given A times the probability of P of A. So if you actually, you can, I wish I could draw on this thing. Can, but, oh, I can. Cool, let's see. Uh, so like here, you have, oh, come on. P of A, B equal to P of A given B times P of B. This is, by the way, how I like to remember uh, Bayes because it's better to learn it from derivation. And then equivalently, this is the same as P of B given A times P of A. This is pretty easy to remember, right? Because the last thing is the thing here. And then so now if I wanna do sort of Bayes formula, which you may have seen, I'm just starting here and I'm dividing through. And so P of B of A, P of A, whoops, divided by P of A, B. 
And so this is what you're called. This is your prior. Right? This is what we believe about A. This is your likelihood. Er. No. This is the likelihood. This is the weighting factor. Uh, and this is your posterior. Meaning your observed uh, data. Cool. Hopefully that, that, that helps. Um, how do I turn this off? Grace. Okay. Don't quote me. Look this up later. I have another lecture on it somewhere. Okay. So now we can do a little bit of math. Um, and so now we can take that and we can extrapolate that and blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. Let me just confirm something. Okay. I was right and talked myself out of it. So, let's go back. So, let's do this again. So, P of A and B equal to P of A given B times P of B. And we're going to divide this by P of A because what I've done here is now P of B given A, right? So P of A would have been here, right? As before. And so let's just invert this whole thing. So P of B given A, this is the posterior. And then this is going to be equal to P of a given B times P of B times P of A. So this is what's known as the prior. This is the likelihood. And this is sort of a weighting, the weighting distribution. Okay. So you can kind of see here, right, that th this is literally the equation here, although it hasn't been written out the same way, right? So here we have the exterior. This is our likelihood, and this is our prior, and this is our weighting, or what's called the evidence, right? So we know how many people are boring, right? B over the population. We know how many muggles there are. This is our prior, muggles over the population, and to, to now we can kind of boring given that they're muggles is sort of the you know something that we can calculate uh, based on this up here. Uh, no, well yes, this. Um, I'm getting in the weeds here, but you can kind of see how you can backtrack, and once you have the numbers, uh, you can kind of figure this all out. Yeah, sorry. Again, Bayesian, it gets annoying from a math perspective, but, but uh, once you have all these numbers, you just kind of plug and chug and it's all good. Cool. So let me go back to normal. And so, yeah, th that's the, uh, you can kind of see here, the data on the right is going to be uh, observed data, right? So as we look at a person, and we know if their muggles are boring or whatever, we can update all these, da all these data points and then, as a result, update our probability estimate that given that somebody's boring, are they a muggle or not? So this is how you would kind of leverage this data. Um, and, and in the context of using a Bayes network, this is sort of how you would do it. You just do it in a sort of graph form. You would be in a particular state. Certain things would happen. You would make a prediction. And uh, based on that, you would constantly update your um, these parameters that determine what to do. So uh, we're not going to go too deep into actually how to do this. Uh, I recommend reading up on this sort of separately if you want to build one of these for like your project or something like that, because the implementation can be a little bit frustrating. But ultimately, the, the underlying kind of core thing is that it's a um, finite state machine that is constantly keeping count of a sort of, we're in a particular state, we make a prediction, what's our next state, and then we like at the actual state, and then we can constantly update the, um, the, the underlying assumptions, meaning these parameters that we're trying to um, update to make better and, and fit the data that we're seeing closer and closer. 
So I think the difference between a finite state machine and the um, BaseNet here is that a BaseNet is trying to reproduce the data that you've seen thus far. Um, so if without data, then you, you know, so if a finite state machine would, does not predict anything. And uh, in the same way, a Bayesian uh, thing won't do anything without in the absence of data. So while they look sort of similar in their implementation, their usage is quite different, right? I think the better, like a good example here is um, a model that tries to predict like uh, your power bill, right? Um, so given events such as, you know, rain or snow or hot or cold, or what's the temperature, uh, a model that's trying to kind of, you know, predict this underlying thing. And if you're really, really interested in this, I recommend you uh, check out um, what's called a hidden Markov model, which uh, is, is another kind of idea here where your observed data is actually not the underlying hidden state. There's actually a hidden state that manifests as um, different observable uh, data, right? So like I'm hungry is a hidden, like, but, but that might be the hidden state, but the I'm eating, so I might be hungry. That That's the observable, I'm eating, so I'm, I was previously hungry, and then you can kind of back into that. Um, so I'm not gonna go through these examples because the, they're just, it's just Bayes, as we talked about. Uh, one notable thing here, right, is if you're a sprinkler and rain, given rain and so on, uh, you can kind of get the sum as we, you know, by, by adding probability that it's, uh, that you're going into sprinkler given rain plus the probability we're going into sprinkler and we're not rain. And that is going to be equal to the probability of the sprinkler. And it's because um, if rain is a binary variable, uh, the probability of the conditional that, that, you know, is going to be equivalent to, to that um, if you sum them together. Yeah, so anyways, this is uh, just kind of the, the worked out thing. You get a small value and a little bit more complicated. So if you want, please look at the, the lecture notes. I'm not going to work through this example. Um, you can just see it's a bunch of numbers. <laughs> and this is where Bayes gets a little bit annoying because it's like just counting. But counting, um, and this is why we build systems for this, it can, can get tedious. And more examples. Okay, so um, recommend this is where the, the data, the, these examples came from. And so please use this or feel free to use an online tool um, that lets you create these Bayes nets and play around with them. Um, so that's it. And uh, I'll see you in the next lecture where we'll talk a little bit about dynamic difficulty adjustment and uh, genetic algorithms. Bye.